Good afternoon, and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series and podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We're pleased to have Morten Jensen, historian, author, and politician, join us to discuss Denmark's cap on non-Western immigration. How goes it? Mr. Jensen will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask, ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Mr. Morton of Orskov Jensen. Thank you so much, uh, Stacey. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Morten Orskov Jensen from uh, Denmark. Uh, I've been commenting on Danish politics for 15 years almost, uh, especially through my column in the uh, Danish newspaper, Jyllandsposten. Uh, by the way, the newspaper that printed the Muhammad cartoons back in 2005 and where Kurt Westergaard, by the way, just died here. May he rest in peace five days ago. I've been invited to talk here. I'm very honored to do so. So I wish to uh, thank uh, Middle East Forum very much for this opportunity. Uh, what I would like to talk about is um, the present Danish uh, government, especially the social democratic government uh, headed by um, Mette Frederiksen, female uh, prime minister, the second we've had, by the way. Um, to start, to begin with what this government is proposing, uh, and which I believe they actually do uh, sincerely, they really mean it, so to speak, is actually for Denmark not any longer to have any refugees at the doorstep of Denmark, so to speak. Uh, that if you are seeking refuge, you should apply for it in uh, some countries that Denmark will be cooperating with. Uh, Rwanda has been mentioned, the Kenya has been mentioned, could be other countries also, of course, South America and Asia. Uh, uh, what do I know? You can continue the list. Uh, the very, very interesting thing about that, of course, that really two things here, that would be that if the Danish government, which I really, really hope, um, if they succeed with what they have been planning to do, it would be the first time in 38 years that Denmark actually controls its borders, because since 1983, I'm not going to lecture a long historic uh, thing here, just wish to say that for almost four decades, uh, Denmark does not have control of its borders because of political decisions taken inside Denmark, which have allowed all asylum seekers to turn up at the Danish border, whether it be by airport or land crossing, whatever, and say, I wish to seek for asylum. And the Danish authorities would then have to prove that you were not, did not have legitimate grounds for asylum, otherwise you would be let in. This would really be a turning point, because not only <clears throat> would it mean that asylum seekers <clears throat> will have to seek for asylum outside Denmark, but that it's also the government's intention that if you are granted asylum, you will have asylum in one of those countries, not in Denmark. So that would really be a break, which <laughs> you might call it tradition. I would call it some of the more malfunctioning traditions. But, but I hope you take my gist. The point would be that Denmark is saying uh, don't have to take any more uh, asylum seekers, other, of course, than what we explicitly would like to, could be an author that is persecuted or whatever it, it could be. Uh, but this really would be a turning point. So far, uh, we have also managed in Denmark to have a certain cooperation from the United Kingdom. That is very interesting, I think, personally, because I think in terms of political correctness, etc., I think United Kingdom is, uh, uh, has got a lot more than that than, than Denmark's actually uh, got in, in the last decades. We've also had uh, some quite angry reactions from the European Union. European Union consists of uh, 27 member states after uh, Britain or United Kingdom has left it. Uh, but of course, uh, also all the most powerful states in Europe are still members besides United Kingdom. That would be Germany, France, uh, Italy, Spain, etc. Especially from Germany and also from Austria. Uh, smaller country, yes, but still 
uh, there's been heavy criticism of uh, the plans that that the present Danish government is trying to pursue uh, because it's seen as they claim on solidarity, etc., uh, that we should all share in, in the burden, so whatever you would call it, of uh, receiving uh, asylum seekers inside Europe. The point is this, uh, just a, a, a few statistics. Uh, when I was 16 years old in 1980, three years before we had this uh, thoroughly changing law, the refugee law from 1983, in 1980, we had 1% of the population um, with ancestry in, in what we might call the third world or non-Western countries, whatever you'd like to call it. Today, we got 10%. Uh, we also have a fact that these 10% make up for around 15, 15% of all births. So uh, a demographic change of uh, very great proportions are taking place and have done so for, for quite a while. The thing also is, which I would like to emphasize, which I also understand that Middle East Forum has been somewhat interested in, is the fact that why is it a social democratic government? I mean, that's a center left government. Of course, it is in Denmark also. Why is it a center left government that are pursuing these things, that are pursuing these goals by uh, of, of a policy where you do not anymore uh, uh, take in asylum seekers? Why is it not a center right government or a right government, whatever? Uh, parties like the Conservative People's Party or a liberal party, I should say to Americans that liberal party in Denmark means actually a party to the right. It's, it's because it's a non-socialist party. Um, why haven't they done so? And that is curious because I believe this stems back from 2001. Uh, just a few months after 9-11, we had a general election in Denmark where the present social democratic uh, government was ousted, uh, lost heavily in what you might easily call a landslide. And the subsequent elections in, in 2005, 2007, uh, with the exception of 2011, but also in 2015, meaning four out of five elections, the Social Democrats lost. Why did they lose? They lost because they, uh, they stood for a very liberal, um, very liberal immigration policy. That is clearly the, the defining thing about why they lost. Of course, there are other causes, but that would be the most important one. What happened then in the 2000s, in the 20 years, was that the populist party, I, I don't mean populist in a, in a negative way, I'm, rather, I'm re really using it in a neutral way. I see a populist party as a party that is uh, putting things on the agenda uh, that the mainstream politicians don't want to put on the agenda or want to be hushed down. Uh, but the Danish People's Party, Dansk Folkeparti in Danish, Danish People's Party, they uh, stood for a cause um, from 1998, where they said, no, we can't have this much immigration. It is changing the face of Denmark culturally, uh, ethnically, religiously, etc. Especially the Muslim immigration, but all over immigration, but it's probably no secret to a lot of people here that, that on average, the Muslim immigration, uh, immigration is the most problematic because of low uh, general achievement in school, low educational level, low participation in, the, in, the, uh, in, 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 in work, in, in, um, in labor, uh, and high crime rates. On average, of course. Of course, there are role models, et cetera. We all know that. But on average, we have, we have a problem here. Uh, but what the Danish People's Party did. And why I'm saying this is because it's interesting also to understand what the Social Democratic Party are doing today. Danish People's Party, they stole, <laughs> it's legal to steal votes, you know, of course, they stole lots, massive number of votes from the Social Democrats. Why? Because they said, we want a tough immigration policy, but we also want a welfare state. And now I have to say something to Americans that may be a bit odd. But in Denmark, whether you like it or not, I'm, I'm sort of in the middle. I'm a kind of social conservative, believing in a certain form of welfare state, but also believe it's, it's grown too big. But the simple fact is this, between 70 and 75% of the Danish voters 
believe in an extensive welfare state, and I really mean extensive. High taxes, yes. Free health care, made paid by the tax, taxpayers, of course. Uh, uh, public health care, uh, well, uh, health care, uh, public schools, uh, uh, high schools, gymnasium, uh, elderly care, uh, high level of social security, elderly pensions are on a high level, etc. these things. I know they are quite different from many, many other countries, including the USA, but this is just a simple fact. And that means, or that meant, that the Danish People's Party, by making a combination of a strict immigration policy and a welcoming approach to the welfare state, meaning we won't turn all these things back or cut down, they received masses of votes culminating in, in 2015, where they had more than 21% of the votes. And now back to the present, or rather four years ago, what happened in 2015, uh, the chosen Democrats had again lost an election and made a Frederiksen, our present prime minister, was uh, became head of the Social Democratic Party. She had formerly been, I, I would even say, immensely politi correct, political correct, uh, really, but I'm not uh, going to that. She changed her attitude, she changed her, she really changed her opinion, she changed her mind, quite literally. I don't believe, as some do, that she'll do an out of, you know, just being tactical. I do believe she means it. What she saw as, um, uh, what she came to see was that, in, as I said, in, in the crime area, in the uh, labor market area, these things, she came to realize one important thing for a social democrat, and that was that if this, if present immigration, or if, if the then present immigration uh, numbers were to continue, the welfare state would gradually be lost because you can only uphold such an extensive welfare state as the Danish one by having a sufficient number or rather a sufficient percentage share of the working population, of the grown-up population, actually working, actually paying taxes, actually paying a lot of taxes, making a lot of money, pay, making a lot of uh, uh, tax payment in order to, to, uh, to make sure all these things can happen, as I said, with elderly care, with health care, etc. And that was what came to mind, came to me in Fred Rickson's mind in 2015, 16, something like that. And that meant that when they, we had the last general election in 2019, almost exactly two years ago, the Social Democrats with uh, Rita Fredrickson and her, I don't know what the English expression, but her, her, her knights, so to speak, her, her people just behind her, you know, like, um, like the integration minister, Matthias Tesfaye, or the justice minister, Nick Hegel, uh, which they became, they said, we want a social democratic welfare state and we want strict immigration policy. And now, as I said in the beginning, they are even contemplating this and trying to do so, uh, at, that having asylum seekers should seek outside Denmark. Uh, and you see, it's a combination of a center-left economic policy and a center-right, maybe even right, uh, immigration policy that have made them very popular with the Danish electorate. I'm not going to vote for them myself. I can easily see that. I'm going to write for a traditional conservative party next time. But I understand, and I'm trying to give my interpretation of what has made them so popular. And I must say, I believe they will win at least also next time. The next election will be held at the latest 2023. We, have, we don't have fixed terms. We have elections uh, at the latest uh, four years apart, but it could be earlier. We also have proportional uh, representation, meaning that a government has to have supporting parties. You don't have, we have 10 parties in parliament. We don't have a, never have a situation where one party has more than 50% of the vote, more than 50% of the seat. Uh, but I think the Social Democratic Party will continue. The amusing thing, if I may put it uh, like that, I'm approaching the end here. We can see I'll go spend my 15 minutes, is that the government supporting parties the unity list, uh, the Social Liberal Party, the Socialist People's Party, uh, they don't support the government's immigration policy, <laughs> but they don't have a choice because otherwise they would have to support 
uh, the right side of the political spectrum. So they don't have a choice. And that's why I believe the Social Democrats will, will uh, likely continue this party. I, I really do hope they succeed with especially uh, halting um, uh, the mass uh, inflow of, of, uh, of refugee seekers in Denmark. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time. I would very much like to, uh, to take questions, but thank you so much for now. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. We have quite a few questions coming in. The first one from Daniel Pipes. Uh, please compare the comp political situation in Denmark with Norway and Sweden. Why have only the Danish Social Democrats changed their view of non-Western immigration? That is a very good question. Um, if we were to put them in a ranking and say the toughest uh, uh, is the top here, that's Denmark clearly. Then we have Norway some way in between, also Finland, by the way, to take another Nordic country. Uh, and then we clearly have Sweden as the laxest, as the most liberal country there. But you also see the consequences, high, high crime rates in Sweden, much, much higher than in Denmark with gangs, etc. But why? And that was the question I heard it. Uh, that is a tough question to answer because, I mean, it can only be tentative in some way. I can't, you know, I can't put, put to a statistics. But I'd say one thing, in, in Denmark, contrary to Sweden, even though we have a lot of common with the Swedes, I mean, we are after all neighbors and we have had so much, et, et cetera. Um, but the Swedes way down in history, all the way back to the at least the uh, 16th century, have had a lot more of, um, authoritarian kind of government. Also, of course, when they were, you know, an absolutist uh, uh, kingdom or had, you know, only the, the high noblemen elite having in charge, but also when they became a democracy. Whereas in Denmark, we have somehow, I don't know exactly why, but we have a much longer tradition of people's, ordinary people's participation in, in political matters. I don't know if you heard about Grundtvi, that was very famous, you know, with, with uh, people's high schools. High school is not the American way. That was for ordinary people from the countryside going to a place for six months, you know, debating things, discussing things. So things in Sweden generally have been much more top down. In Denmark, much more bottom up. That's why the politicians had to to, to do something about the concerns from the bottom. Understood, thank you. That would be thank my answer, <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so what exactly is the uh, percentage of Muslim residents in Denmark? And what do you attribute that to the majority of Muslim immigrants refusing to assimilate? Sorry, Stacey, the first thing you said was what? The... what? What exactly is the percentage of Muslim residents in Denmark? Uh, what, what Muslims in Denmark feel generally or? Yeah, in general, or uh, also, I guess, if you have both statistics, like what is the, the general yeah. percentage versus? Uh, how we have people? actually pretty elaborate statistics, also contrary to Sweden, by the way. Um, just like the US Census Bureau, I'm pretty impressed by that, by the way, because you also, <laughs> never mind. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, we break down uh, after ancestry, let's say, is it from Somalia, Turkey, Pakistan, Afghanistan, whatever. You can actually see um, uh, what is the participation in the work, working in labor market, uh, what is the crime rate, what is the crime rate for second generation, which are always higher than for first generation, which is in itself very wor worrying, of course. And what you can see there generally is that it, you, it is the, it, the groups that stems from countries with a majority Muslim population are on average by by far the most problematic uh, you can all uh, and, and again a, a thing you also know from the us chinese immigrants don't commit crime <laughs> they're very low crime for instance vietnamese don't come i mean they are lower than danish people actually uh, in, in crime rates uh, and what can you say else of course you have role models you have uh, uh, both politicians or muslim politicians and muslim you know people debating that clearly uh, love this country <laughs> and really want to share its values the problem, as I see it, is that a majority, maybe even a large majority, it's hard to say, they prefer to live among themselves in what we in Denmark sometimes call ghetto, sometimes called socially um, oh, belested, almost, you know, uh, 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 municipal buildings that have a hard time, et cetera, and things like that. Um, and, 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 and you clearly see it. Let's take a matter like the schools, the public schools. 
uh, you have something like when, when you come up above 20, 25 percent of, of Muslims, or for that matter, uh, people from non-Western countries, you will typically have what you in the United States probably call white flight. You will have uh, uh, parents with the means uh, to it, pulling out the, their, their children, putting them to private schools, etc. So yes, of course, they are role models. Of course, they are people who we would like to welcome. The problem is that when you at the same time have a large percentage that do not want to assimilate or even to integrate, and you continue to have an influx, it's the combination of these two things that, that bodes ill for the future, right? That they can continue to build up the, yeah, the parallel societies, as we also call them in Danish, parallel societies. They are not meeting except when you have conflict. I, I, hope, I hope that's some kind of answer to your question. Yes, and to what do you attribute that the majority of Muslim immigrants refuse to assimilate? I'm a historian, but of course I know something about religion. I'm not an expert in religion. Uh, I think it's hard to, I mean, you also have groups uh, from non-Muslim countries that are not doing exceptionally well, but typically you will still see that they have, uh, they have much easier to accommodate themselves and to, to integrate to a certain degree in Danish society. Um, so it has struck me, of course, that the religion of Islam tends to be so absolutistic, uh, if that is the word. Uh, you have a famous uh, Dutch um, sociologist, uh, Robert, uh, uh, Robert Koop, Koopman, he's called, a uh, professor at a German uh, university, has made elaborate research which consistently finds that Muslim immigrants in Europe are much more, you know, they don't want to have Jews as friends, they don't want to have homosexuals as friends, to a much larger degree. All on average, we know that, right? Always have exceptions, but to a larger degree, uh, a much larger percentage, meaning that a holy scripture, the Quran, should be read um, uh, literally, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all these things. So I have a hard time not saying that. I, I think it has got to do something with the teachings of the Quran, of course. Uh, but but it's 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 often a quite it, it's a complicated question. Some of the some of the things I personally believe that is actually too little emphasized is the clan structure that many of the immigrants come from. The clan structure is very very widespread in the Arab world, meaning that you don't trust the state, you don't trust society, you don't trust police. I don't say we want an enormous welfare state. That's not the point. But you should trust the authorities that when you have them. Uh, but if you only trust the extended family, you have a problem in itself. And then it is excavated, I think it's called in English, by the, um, in the combination of a clan mentality and a very, in many ways, rigid religion like Islam. Uh, that, that is a problem in a modern, sophist uh, sorry to say so, sophisticated Western, Western country uh, like that. I don't know if sophisticated is right, but you know what I mean. A modern country where equality of of men and women, et cetera, is, is taken for granted all these things, right? And you can pursue anything you like. Uh, so so a, a thing like the plant society is actually a little underestimated sometimes. Uh, Mark Weiner, uh, sorry, Mark S. Weiner, an American, he has written a very, very interesting book five years ago. I actually think he's a liberal. He, he calls himself a liberal, but he's written a book called The Rule of the Clan. The Rule of the Clan. I can, very, I can highly recommend it. It's only 200 pages long, but it's clearly seen that the clan itself is a problem uh, be because it clashes with the individualism of Western societies. Thank you. From Edward Kaplan, uh, isn't it required under international law to grant refuge to those who have well-founded fear of persecution in their home country? How is Denmark going, uh, going against this? It is actually interesting. Uh, it is correct that today we interpret in most of Europe, we interpret that it is a right. But before 1983, 1983, that is after all 38 years after the Second World War, and Denmark was one of the signatories, the first signatories to ratify the uh, Refugee Convention in 1951. But between 1951 and 1983, I know it because I wrote a book 12 years ago, Called, I called it the divided people about the discussions in Denmark about this topic. But 32 years, 
it was interpreted in Denmark that it was a Danish uh, authorities sole decision whether to grant asylum or not, meaning that you could not say, I, I demand asylum under certain grounds. The Danish authorities could always say, no, you can't. It is correct that you have, it's for some reason in, a friend, in French, or non refoulement, I think it's called, you, you must not send a person back if he or she risks immediately risk torture, for instance. But the point here still is, if you can find a safe haven for a true refuge, now I'm talking about a true refuge, and, and that is not, and by the way, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to sound cynical, but it's not enough to flee a civil war. You actually have to be personally in fear of your life. You have to have your name on a desk list or something like that. Then, of course, you, you have ground for, to be to a fear and, and you should be protected. But it doesn't say anything anywhere about where that should happen. And that's exactly why the Danish, as I started to say, why they, they are negotiating with countries like Rwanda, or Kenya, or, or whatever it will turn out to be. Because yes, you're right and agree, but that is certainly also possible to protect the few people who really are. I mean, of course, I know the Syrian civil war is a tragedy. It's an immense tragedy, but it is not the same that we have, uh, have to accept that millions of Syrians are coming up here. And we already know that the crime levels are high after that. But of course, we can solve this problem so that Mr. Kaplan, I believe it was called, uh, it will also be satisfied, I'm sure. Thank you so much. Uh, from Jack Berkowitz, uh, I've read the Mus about Muslim no-go zones in Denmark, whereby emergency service workers, including police, fire, and EMS, are barred from entering and servicing the community. Is this accurate? Yes, it is. It is on a much lower scale than in Sweden, where you have large no-go for not to mention France, with the son sensible. Uh, but we do have the same, but on a lower level. We have we have our clear. Uh, all states know where the ghettos, the large ghettos are. They are in, in Volsmose, in Odense, the third largest city. They are in Gellor Park in Aarhus, the second largest city. They are in Tinkbjerg and Mjölner Park in Copenhagen, our capital. Uh, we all, they are in Korsør. I live on Western Zealand, you know, 80 kilometers from Copenhagen, but, but just uh, 15 or 30 kilometers away from here, they also have their local ghetto. Where, I'm not saying that fireworkers or police officers, whatever, uh, uh, for certain will have stone thrown at them, but the risk is just much, much higher if they go there, but not on a level like Sweden. I, I would like to emphasize that the Swedish uh, politicians have for decades done such a outstanding job, outstanding was a sarcasm, that they are 30 years ahead of Denmark. I, I really mean it. I really do think they're 30 years ahead in, the, in a very bad sense, of course. They are way out there and are ruining their welfare state, by the way. Uh, so yes, we have that. We have that thing that, that uh, the, but but not on the scale like France and, and Sweden. Understood. Uh, from Brian Cox, is Denmark a canary in the coal mine in regards to the backlash on Muslim immigration in Europe? Mm -hmm. Do you think that other European countries will learn from this? In Western Europe, I think we are, in, in a certain way, the canary in the coal mine. Uh, we have to remember here, by the way, that the countries that were communist dictatorships until 1989, they have a quite different approach to it because they also have, you know, uh, smartphones and internet connections. And, and when they look at what's happening in France and Britain and Germany and Sweden, they, they don't say, ah, oh, we would love that thing here. No, they don't. So they... they they take a quite different course. But in Western Europe, in Western Europe, yes, I'd say Denmark is it. But I also, I'm not overestimating the possibilities of Denmark because we are a small country, 5.8 million inhabitants. I believe if something serious for the better is going to, to happen, it will happen in the large uh, European countries like France or Britain or Germany. Uh, I mean, they are still in a European context, a major power, so to speak. I'm not trying to know old fashioned here because it's not on a world scale, of course, but they are. It's so much more important who the German chancellor is than, than who is the prime minister. And then. But of course, we can do a lot of things. Much and maybe we can set an example if the government really succeeds with this, with these plans they've got. Thank you. And then earlier on, you mentioned that the UK has actually been supportive. Alex Griller asks, how bad is the situation in the UK? That is very, very bad. 
uh, I don't know how many followed it, but uh, two or three years ago, it came to light. It was so a long time. So that, that grooming had taken place, grooming these horrible things where uh, quite young girls all the way down to 11 or 12 years old had been mass raped, et cetera, seduced, whatever, uh, uh, through length of time, um, serial rape, you could even call it, uh, typically being from a uh, working class area, depressed areas in Bradford and Leicester and Leeds and uh, uh, these cities uh, uh, that, you know, suffered from not, uh, yeah, just like your rust belt a little bit, if I may com make a comparison like that. And because of anxiety being called racist, these things had taken place for decades. And when it finally came to light, the estimates that, that went highest, I should say, is that between 10 and 15,000 almost exclusively white ethnic uh, British girls and quite young females, women, had been, as I said, uh, raped uh, and overwhelmingly by people which they call Asian, but typically coming from Bangladesh and Pakistan. Uh, just to get the cat out of the back here, because that is what we're talking about in this case. They were overwhelmingly by, by Pakistan, especially, by the way. Uh, so yes, it is very bad. In, in London, uh, London has got, uh, what is it, uh, 10 years ago, 45% uh, Britons left. Uh, Luton, a city just north of London, uh, way below, uh, below 40%. Birmingham has just tipped this year, has got a, a minority of, of indigenous uh, uh, European people. So uh, things are very bad. You can easily go in the su southern England and see beautiful sites and all this, but uh, there will be a lot of districts in, in the largest cities where you don't, don't want to go. Thank you so much. Uh, before we go, can you let our viewers know where we can find some of your work? Uh, the easiest thing would be to go to uh, Julian's first. You can just write uh, jp.dk jp.dk uh, then you uh, press uh, where it says menu uh, m-e-n-u menu and then you find blogs b-l-o-g-s of course yeah <laughs> uh, and then you will you can find somewhere you know on this thing you, you'll be able to find me uh, now i'm just on vacation i write about one one time a week so sometimes two times a week something like that and if you don't uh, uh, speak they of Read Danish, you will have to do with a Google French. But, but I, 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 let you, I let you tell the audience up to that. But, but that will typically be a way you can follow me. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We've unfortunately come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again, Mr. Jensen, for speaking with us today. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure and a, a great honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, for our viewers and listeners, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for an update from Ashley Perry. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.